Are you ready? Oh yeah! It's still real to me, damn it! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SNS here on TBK Magazine and TBKRadio.com. And guys and gals, we have a very special episode for you today. Um, I, I talked about this on our last episode as we watched WCW Uncensored 1995, and I still don't understand why we did it, but we did it. And But it is Pride Month, and it is a very special month to me as a wrestling fan. And today... We have a very special guest, and this all started because I was perusing Twitter, and some I douche canoe decided to yell homophobic and transphobic things at Nyla Rose, who is an amazing performer. She's an amazing person. And after that happened, the wrestling world banded together against this guy, and I love it. And this video got posted about the person who sold the tickets on StubHub and donated the money to this amazing cause. And now we believe in this cause. And joining us today is the person behind that cause. And I am so excited. Independent wrestler, Billy Dixon. How are you doing today? Hey, what's popping? What's going on with you? Uh, not much. Uh, I have to tell you right out of the gate, what you're doing is amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the Pride Pile Driver Project, I hope I got that right, is, right, is one of the best things I have seen in wrestling in years. Oh, wow. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. But first, before we get to the Pride Pile Driver Project, because we have to save some meat for later in this interview, let's talk about you. How, let's do it. I, let, I just watched this documentary on you, and it's a tremendous documentary. If you haven't seen it, check out the Matter of Pride uh, YouTube page. But you discovered wrestling at a young age, from what I'm gathering. Yep. Um, so, background on me is that I grew up in the South Bronx in New York City, and my mom was sick, and, excuse me, my mom was sick, and um, we lived with my grandparents, so sometimes when she would work, or, or she had things to do. Uh, she wouldn't be home sometimes, and uh, I would watch Raw with my grandparents, and uh, it was like the coolest thing. Like this, like generational, like divide on like who we liked and who we hated. And every Monday night, like we banded around the TV and just like marked out. You know, <laughs> who were some of your favorites at that time? Oh, so this would have been the Attitude Era. So as a kid, I was attracted to colors. So I loved Kane. I loved um, the Hardy Boys. I loved Chris Jericho. I loved Lita. I loved... Um, God, I'm forgetting someone. I loved... I The Hardy Boys. I loved... I, <laughs> oh, they were... Oh, they, they captured my imagination. I loved um, Edge and Christian... I loved. I was really into tag team stuff yeah, as a kid because like stuff that. like the chain, um, and I really loved. I think my number one favorite in my childhood at that point would have been China, because as a queer kid, um, and you don't know the language, and you don't know like the ins and outs of who you are, but you know there's something different about you, and I think the number one thing about China was that China was different. But her different was special. And I think her complete, uh, the, the packaging of her and her kind of spitting gender roles in the face, especially during the 1990s, was refreshing to see. And just, I think for me as a kid, I just identified with that. And I didn't know what I was identifying with, but something um, made me stop, point at this TV screen and go, her. So. I think China was my number one favorite. So seeing that here's China on the screen and being that you are 
having to deal with BS from random people all the time. Did you use China as an inspiration to get through every day? Um, or just wrestling in general at that time? Yeah, so that would probably, if we fast forward, wrestling got me through uh, middle school. Um, so when I was younger, the first time I was called um, uh, a homophobic slur would have been when I was three years old. Oh, wow. um, and I was in daycare and one of the teachers said, and I remember it. It's so crazy. Cause like I have the worst memory, but there are some things you don't forget. And I remember I was just hanging out with like the little girls or whatever, like that is a little hazy. But one of the teachers said, oh yeah, he's going to be a little F word one day. And I was just like, I didn't know that was a bad word. It's just something about that moment. I think stuck in the back of my head. Um, and I, and I could tell that that was something weird um, and that me like just being my authentic self and like was, 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 it was not okay to, to some extent with people. But in middle school was when I was really um, dealing with homophobia on a regular basis where long story short i had a i had my first ever crush and i confided in my friends about it and unfortunately new york city buses belong to everybody so i can get on one we didn't know that there was this girl who sat in the back of the bus that overheard the whole conversation and literally the next day at school it was like the regina oh. george mean girls moment like oh. everyone knew about it everyone was going crazy i was walking to school in into school and like at that point like, I was, like, I got along with everybody, like, the jockey kind of guys. Like, I had guy friends. I had girlfriends. A lot of people laughed at me and yada, yada, yada. So I I don't want to use mental health terms um, uh, in vain here, but I would say that I, I, I went into a really bad funk, and I got really upset and very sad, and school was unbearable for me. Because not only am I figuring out my thing, like I'm figuring out gender things, I'm figuring out sexuality things, I'm trying to understand what's going on. But now me in the process of doing that, now that process is being weaponized against me. And by a school that is not going to do anything about it, by family that doesn't get it, or thinks that it's a phase or doesn't want to accept it. So um at that point i was at the lowest of the low but wrestling for those four hours five hours because i watched tna at the time um, oh wow really kept me going oh, wow. <laughs> yeah i went i i i i had like the best like childhood because i got like attitude era and then like the like the like the ruthless aggression slash like tna help us obi-wan you're our only hope kind of phase so <laughs> um, so true to that so true at that time too <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um so it, it was cool and and wrestling at that point was was just it was a safe place it was a haven and i could get lost in that world and i would forget i would watch wrestling and i would forget um and i think the moment that made me want to be a wrestler was i can remember it I think it was June 1st, 2007. Oh, wow. This is an and anniversary, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, when Candice Michelle defeated Melina to become the women's champion. That was the first time wrestling made me cry. Because I identified with Candice Michelle just because, like, it wasn't natural to her. She worked really hard. And people gave her... Uh, can I curse on this? Yeah, you can say whatever you want. <clears throat> oh, people gave her shit because she, like, <laughs> did Playboy and, like, was a hot girl that got signed because she was hot. Like, that was her fault. Like, and um, she really worked hard and she busted her ass and, like, and and she overcame. And to me, as a young Mark, like, watching watching someone that shouldn't be there do do the thing and win. And, like, at that point, like, I'm getting harassed and i'm getting you know threatened to be killed and jumped and like and, and in other instances i am getting jumped and i am getting harassed and beat up like to me she was my underdog i don't know why i connected with her she was she was my favorite she's my 
number one favorite wrestler of all time. Um, She's also very underrated. I, I think everyone should. Oh my god! Should. Yeah, like Josie Queen, please. Like, um, <laughs> she, I really, I have such a soft spot for her. I really liked her, but yeah, she she is a very important person to me. But that was the moment of um, like uh, hope. But that kind of illustrates like wrestling got me through, because middle school was the worst four years of my life. And and I take it the school really didn't care at that point like and i understand I mean, that i reported it a lot i mean at the same time i was <clears throat> i was one of those kids where you can't pee on, pee on my leg and tell me it's raining so i called out a lot of bullshit and they didn't appreciate that and i also went to a charter school known as the knowledge is power program which if i'm just saying i wouldn't send my child to that charter school um, where basically, like, I guess, like, anything that was a PR, like, because uh, they had a lot of money coming from, like, big foundations and, like, really rich, rich people. Um, I guess any kind of PR thing was a was not a good look, and we were all used for money and profits. But, um, yeah, they weren't going to do anything about it. That just makes my stomach churn. Yeah. I don't... Since I've, since I've moved on, they have a GSA now, and I went and because it's a part of a, it's a it, now it's a program that you can go literally from kindergarten to twelfth grade. But I, I they opened up a high school and I only went there for one year before I moved to Virginia. And uh, I went I visited to film for the documentary that I was doing, and they weren't having it. And then they told me that they had a GSA, and they had gender inclusive bathrooms. And the the response by the 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 dean, Mr. Chen, was. Um, not like this is really cool, but it was, well, you know, because times are changing. And the tone in which she said it, and the kind of, like, dismissive nature was just like, oh, like, the time, like, I came with a bloody nose because I got jumped by six guys, like, you still don't get it. Okay. Okay. I, I love but that if, as an if it's helping queer kids, I'm all for it, but, you know, we can't police thought, unfortunately, so... You would hope people would get it, but, you know. In due time. I still believe in due time. Agreed. Uh, so you're now, you moved to Virginia during your high school age, I'm taking? Yeah, so, because um, I was going down a dark path, and because I wanted acceptance where I could find it. And I found acceptance in things that were far too mature for me at the time, and sneaking into, like, bars and clubs and like dating older guys like and just like not behaving you know like just like not caring about right. if i lived or died or any of that kind of stuff moving really fast um so it was just like okay you need to change to see a change of scenery so then i moved to virginia and virginia was great loved it i found virginia to be more accepting of my sexuality than New York, as crazy as that sounds. That baffles me. But I have never gone through any, and I'm so serious. I have never gone through anywhere near the amount of homophobia that I faced when I was in New York. Kudos to Virginia. Anyway. That's that's crazy to me. And even in knowing, like in my head, of hearing how open New York is to everybody at all right. times. Like even back then. Of where I grew up. Versus where I live now, right. there is a uh, you know a socioeconomic difference, um, but and my experience is not monolithic to other queer people, but um, but it is your for me, experience. Yeah, you know, it was it was a definite improvement. I went to a great like normal high school where I was a theater kid and I did other stuff and like I was out and there was no issue and like never had a problem i love other theater kids like it just makes me happy inside just out of curiosity do you remember any plays you were in oh yeah i was the cowardly lion and the wizard of oz and i was uh rooster and bert healy in annie holy cow some good roles yeah. i sorry i just love plays like you could get me started we could talk about that all day this is not that show. oh my god <laughs> do it do a, do a theater <laughs> podcast and i'll be your huckleberry i'm 100 in you will see that later. Trust me, it will happen at this point. 
I so, love it. So at high school is over, I assume the next step is you're going to start living your dream. Yeah, I went to college, hated it. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, in the middle of an exam, I was just like, yeah, whatever. I left, I walked out, and I looked up wrestling schools. Um, unfortunately, at the time, the crop of wrestling schools were not the best. And then the only other wrestling school in the area closed down, so I was forced to go to one. I'm not comfortable at this time to discuss uh, the name of the place, but um, That's I, will just, I will just say this. To any young person listening to this that wants to pursue wrestling, I implore you. I implore you to do your research on your wrestling school look at the careers of the people that are claiming to train you and if they haven't achieved some relative monicum of success do not do not do not get trained by people that do not have monicums of success or great recommendations or great um reputations don't just go for the first thing you see that was a mistake i made um and through that journey uh, you know, unfortunately, I was a victim of um, sexual assault, and um, oh it was like a life-changing experience. But we live, we learn, we grow, um, and we, we we process our trauma. And mine was just now. We're seeing the other. I'm seeing the other side. There is no timetable on healing, but yeah, you don't want to give into a system that uh doesn't give back you don't you don't want to do that 100 percent true um you you want to be around people that want to see you succeed and being hard like having coaches that are hard on you or like really like on your ass like that's good that's what you want but you also want to make sure that you are giving your money and you are learning from someone that actually has the knowledge to get you where you need to go and unfortunately i wasn't smart enough to that so I was, I fell and I became prey and I don't want young people to be prey, prayed, but, um, although there were dark times where I started, uh, I also became the first, uh, openly gay heavyweight champion in Virginia history, which was oh, wow. an, amazing, an amazing accomplishment on February 25th, 2017, um, in front of one of the largest non uh, indie shows with not a WWE name. So, you know, I have that hat to hang, like, to hang my hat on that. Um, sold out crowd, 250 plus, um, which was really good for Virginia indies because Virginia doesn't have a lot of indies. And most indies only draw if you use, like, Billy Gunn or something like that. Yeah, but, you like, have to bring uh, in somebody to draw on an indie. I don't know if anyone knows that. And it, right. it really is sad because I feel like I love watching wrestling on television but you have to support where they come where every wrestler comes from too a hundred a hundred percent but um mm. yeah so wrestling was awesome like learning to wrestle was like um an awesome experience and then like once like i got on the road like uh hijinks ensued like <laughs> that's when you your, your like road stories of like weird <laughs> stuff that you find or like getting pulled over and like literally everyone's like just like going like oh this is going to be good for the documentary like because at that point it's 3 a.m it's the middle of the night you're delirious you don't even know what's going on like the closest thing to you adventures bar crawls like just... i hops i get you <laughs> i live in the south we don't have bars uh <laughs> so do you remember what your first match was like oh my god yeah it was a tag team match. I got three punches and a clothesline in. And the finish was I got distracted and I got powder thrown in my face and I lost to a neck breaker. Old school. I love it. I love the Very fact old that, I love the fact of the powder getting used. Which by the way is the worst thing ever to get in your face. Just want everyone to know. And that. your mouth <laughs> and your gear and your everything. Because it will still be there for months later. It's terrible. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was a rib. So, But if you still have powder in your gear and you get chopped, it looks fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Looks like the old school Power Rangers TV show when the sparks are flying out of the chest. Just boom. <laughs> so true. Uh, so wrestling takes you now on this incredible journey. How did you, or how did Matter of Pride come about? Okay, so a little backstory is when I was living in New York, I would, um, God, this is such a horrible thing I did, but like I would steal my mom's money to go to indie shows. Cause like I didn't have a job and I hated school and I was like, well, if I'm going to do something, let me do something like not like doing drugs with like 30 year olds, you know, but like, um, so I, um, I would go get a bus, a train, a ferry, whatever to get to the, the Rick shows. Cause he was working at the time. Um, still working, but, and <laughs> I would be like, holy shit, there's a, there's a gay wrestler. And like, I know from watching him, he's really gay and i was just like captivated and amazed and i saw uh, i think i seen three or three to five of his shows and i was a fan um and then uh when i started wrestling i gave him a dm and asked some questions here and there and then um i uh started working matches and the first amount of pride came up and i helped him get some coverage from a site called diva dirt on the internet oh, yeah. to cover his stuff and um, I, uh, I, um, I, um, fuck. I, um. It's early in the morning. It's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. I'm just trying to make sure I tell everything chronologically correct. Okay. So, yeah, I started res- wrestling matches. And then he ran the second Matter of Pride show. He sent me a DM asking me if I would want to wrestle. And I was, like, floored and, like, like. <laughs> Am I ready? Like, and I was like, yes, I accepted it. And then me and uh, two of my best friends in wrestling, uh, a wrestler named Elijah Friday and my friend Johnny Andrews, we got a rental car, put all our shit in, and we went on a road trip from uh, Virginia to uh, the show was held in Long Island. And we would stop and we just would get into hijinks and tell funny stories and rib each other. And it was, it was, uh, it was a fun trip. And I wrestled El Elemental out of California and we had a fun match. And that's how I got started at a matter of pride. Because I, I just, okay. So someone sends me a matter of pride because we cover like, I'm a huge wrestling fan. And anytime someone sends me an independent, I'm going to watch it. And I also did not know that there was a wrestling promotion out there that was so open and amazing Mm -hmm. and when diva mania came up this year i went i am so disappointed that this is not streaming on fight like i it was the show i wanted to see during wrestlemania weekend and i think i even mentioned that on this show because that's how much build matter of pride has gotten over with i don't know if it's just I, i out of the northeast but i know it is taken off around the rest of the country at times because i i've seen this pop up in my wrestling feeds that this is the promotion that people need to see too mm-hmm. so i was really i was like oh i really want to see diva mania and then it all got uploaded to youtube and i was 100 percent fine with that but there is your matches at diva may or at matter of pride because i you tell this story in your documentary about molly holly like being a molly holly fan and actually doing the molly holly story in a way Mm-hmm. And that is amazing well, to me. Both things are real life. So yeah. I wish I could take credit for <laughs> honoring her, but like that was real life. Like, um, you know, they weren't gonna have a match at WrestleMania 20 if they didn't have a hook. Right. So the hair gimmick was a great hook, and Rick was not really a fan of my performances for whatever reason and was going to cut me. And I basically said, give me one shot. I'll do a hair match. I'll shake my head. It'll be fine. I'll do what I got to do. And, you know, it kind of worked out the same way. The pa- so, the passion you have for wrestling, you can just see when you actually say that I'm going to have my head shaved. <laughs> it gets unbelievable. And then the match. Yeah, I just I watched just the like, match. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> and um, I love old school gimmicks like that. I love mass mass. I love hair matches i love all those kind of gimmicks and to me old school will always be the right school so a 100 percent agree i i love the old stipulations that we never get to see anymore 
as long as mm-hmm. no one brings back scaffold matches. I'm okay. Like we're fine yeah. until we get to that point. Like nope. Uh, so your match with I believe is it Eddie McQueen? Eddie McQueen, yes. At, at, and it's on YouTube, and you can see it happen. It's a it's a really good match and tells an amazing story. Thank you. Like I I'm I'm hooked by this promotion. I I, I just I the, it's on my bucket list now to make a show, which is a long way for me, <laughs> but. Uh, and then, because apparently, like, so after that happened, I assume that things went really well, or am I? Yes. Yeah, because you gotten like you're now attacking Effie, who is a huge player in the independent wrestling scene. Yeah, it's a no no. You know, attack. <laughs> you know, attack the, the golden goose. But uh, I don't give a fuck about rules. So. <laughs> That's a T-shirt you need right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on I'm working on merch. I don't want to just slap something on like people really have asked me for merch. Merch is expensive. Number one, number two. Amen. I want my <laughs> merch to be worth buying and um, something that you don't you can wear anywhere, not just at a wrestling show. So you're not gonna get giant graphic tees from me. You're gonna get something that like you would see at like a. Um, uh, H&M or you would see it like Nordstrom or something like that where it's a little accessible for everyday wear. I really, that's something I'm really working hard on. So tell us about working with Effie. Um, so yeah, I, I, working with Effie was an amazing, um, an amazing way to uh, engage more with people on social media because you are feuding with one of their favorites. And it was a reminder to me that kayfabe never died. Holy shit. <laughs> I was called so many like egregious things and I loved every second of it. And there were people that followed me and then unfollowed me and then blocked me. And I'm like, whoa, like you really believe the story we're telling. And it was a commentary, and I like to get a little political. It was a commentary on the intersectionality of of my experience as a black gay man, and 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 in and in wrestling, and what I've gone through because I, it's not been all sunshine and roses, and it's been quite difficult. And Effie was down to tell the story, and by by his silence and me doing all the talking, I think people, excuse me, people were taking notice that. I'm a good storyteller and I'm really good at cutting promos and I you could see the passion in that particular feud for wanting to tell a compelling story that lasted several weeks and had a payoff, you know? Yeah, the cul- um, yeah, the culmination of this is the big gay street fight, am I correct? Yeah. And that was a lot of fun and it was uh, I think people were expecting um um a bloodbath based on the promos I was cutting, but I think it was kind of fun to take it into a complete left turn. And it was not a comedy match by any means, but it was, it was just us going nuts with what can we do to make this like so outrageous. And it was quite outrageous. Um, and also, you know, uh, uh, Eric Shorey, DJ accident report from the nobodies. And then, my feud with Effie then spawned me feuding with like several wrestlers because Effie is an incredible talent. You know you're an incredible talent when other talent are like your biggest fan. Yeah. And the things I was saying about Effie, I told him were true. I don't disagree with anything I said. That does not mean I don't think he's incredibly talented. I think he's one of the smartest wrestlers I've ever met. And one of the few people in wrestling that me and him see eye to eye, I wouldn't even have to say a lot of words. A look kind of, you know, we, me and him can communicate without even talking. But, um, yeah, so we put this match together, and I thought it was fun, and he had fun, I had fun, and the fans really loved it. And that was a turning point for me where I think a lot of people, unfortunately, like, there's this thing about me where, People don't necessarily want to believe in me, and I got to chip away at that so that they start believing in me, and they start seeing what I have to offer, and the the program with Effie really, really, really helped that. I think it puts you on the independent wrestling map. 
I, I, because I remember. I think so too, because a lot of those promos were like really like well received and like I like usually like most of my content at that point I was having a dip in engagement. I mentioned him, and I cut the promo called "What's Good, Effie," and I think that changed the game because people were expecting me to cut one kind of promo, and then what they got, they were not. People were not ready for that. Your promos were being shared in social on social media all over the place at that point. And I'm telling you, one of the most built best built shows for the weekend was Matter of Pride Diva Mania. And I no one will I, I don't know how many people will agree with this because it's not the most well known promotion yet. And I I was super excited to see how many people were really taking to that match. Because I think you guys even opened the show, didn't you? We were the first match, yeah. Yeah, there's just like, mm. let, here's the big match. Like, here's this match. And then they did the Chris Canyon Memorial Battle Royal. Um, did you ever have a chance to meet Canyon by chance? No, I didn't. But I knew his story when I was in high school. And uh, to say it was heartbreaking would be like oh. an understatement. Oh. Um, there's a dark side of wrestling, like the Viceland documentary suggests. Um, and unfortunately... You know, he was the first person that was kind of out, but kind of not out, that made it to such a large stage. And I think because of the time he grew up and all of that, his um, his sexuality, uh, he just couldn't cope. And there are some things you can't cope with, and some things you can't you can't move past if, if you're not you know given the right tools and. I think, unfortunately, that's what happened to him. But that story never stuck with me. And actually, I never, I, I don't put myself over, but the Battle Royal being named after him was actually my idea. Oh, right on. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, and I was like, we're going to, because like we, we, th there was talks of a Battle Royal, and I was like, this would be really nice to honor someone that probably would have been very moved to see this today. Yeah, I would love to know his reaction to wrestling now because he would be so accepted in this world. It's not even funny. Like, I wish that he could be around now. And it, it breaks my knowing if you don't know Chris Canyon's story, please. And I think it's going to end up probably being in season two of Vice. I, I've seen that rumor, but go out of your way to look, read the story because it is a heartbreaking story. Canyon, Very much so. Canyon was an unbelievable talent and gr his DDP impression. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, so we we are now heading into Pride Weekend and Pride Month, and I think a lot of questions I want to ask you going forward. And the biggest one is, how do you feel the LGBTQ community is being represented in wrestling compared to where it was when you started? Well. First, I think that I'm incredibly happy for Nyla, and I'm incredibly happy for Sonny for being signed by AEW. You know, this is a major wrestling promotion, you know, that is, that is you know, preaching inclusion. And I'm happy for them, and I really hope that AEW realizes that Nyla and Sonny are incredibly talented and have the opportunity to be some of the biggest wrestling stars in wrestling history. And I'm not saying that because I know them and I love them. I'm saying that because it's true. Um, and I really hope that they capitalize on, on the history that they're making and that this could be such a turning point and there could be such a fan base ignited that it's just, I, I, I can't even talk more about it cause I'll get in tears, but, um, Wrestling right now, it's, it's, we're in a weird place with inclusion. Yes, the visibility is there. We have a lot of out and proud wrestlers. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't come without criticisms and, um, and wanting more. Um, I like that people are running shows that are supposed or quote-unquote inclusive. I think that it's a little nerve wracking and a little uncomfortable for me that the number one person this pride season that is benefiting the most and will profit the most this pride season from what I'm seeing is a white straight man. 
that does not make me happy. And I'm happy that there are people that are running pride shows. However, some of the internal politics of these shows and some of the weirdness of having a pride show, but then also having a well-known homophobe or homophobes on your card or just random straight people for no reason that have not really made themselves out to be allies is a little frustrating. And to me, internally in our community, because we're all very connected, the word ally we think is being used a little listen let me not speak for other people i'll speak for myself the word ally is being used very loosely and i think just because you post something with just because you post your logo with the rainbow does not make you an ally to me that makes you my enemy because you're pandering to me it's and you're a patting me on the head and you're tolerating me it's a marketing ploy that. i mean a lot of companies are using it as a marketing ploy right I to mean, me an ally is somebody that goes and says, listen, people have their own opinions on affirmative action, but it's not that. It's looking at LGBTQ talent. It's looking at your philosophy of your company and maybe thinking of one person. If you can only book one queer person, that's a start. That can fit in the fold and the fabric of your company. And, and not have them wrestle two minute matches and get squashed, but have them in the, the, the moldy company and see what they can do and give them 10, 15 minutes, go out there and do you, you know what I'm saying? Do you and get yourself over. And there, there, there are wrestlers that are queer that are having amazing careers. There are a lot of people that are, and myself included, that are still fighting battles for, for, for bookings, for opportunities, for equality you know our, our our battle is not won because two people signed contracts right the, the the work will never end um but i'm happy that there's more visibility for sure but um you know the way some of these promoters are running these pride shows and the politics behind the scenes i'm not a big fan of and i, I and some of these politics you know, are just downright insulting, I think, to myself. And I can speak for other people to other people as well. And I think that there's also, we're having an issue where the intersectionality of race is becoming a problem. And I think there's a problem of, a, of um, there is this monolithic idea of what it means to be queer in, in wrestling. And, um, you know, I am, I, you know, I am not, and a femophobe. I love femininity. I'm attracted to femininity in the men I date. I um I have no issue with it. However, we're running an issue uh, where if that is the only thing that is perceived as queer, that's an issue. Because I think we're a rainbow because each of us lights up the world in a different way. No two queer people are the same. We don't all share same beliefs. Some of us disagree and some of us are dumb and vote red, you know, but we're all, that doesn't make you less queer. You know what I mean? Yeah. So th there's an internal, there's an internal struggle now where it's like a lot of these people are conservative people that run companies that don't have an understanding of all of it, all of the encompassing ideas and like minefields of it, of being queer and, and figuring that out. But some people are really trying, but also, you know, it, it, when you're black and you're queer and you're 300 pounds build when you're really like 250, but people want to round up 50 whole pounds, but whatever. Um, and you're not the most feminine and you're not the most masculine and you're just being yourself and you're being told you're not queer enough or you're being told, you know, but we already have ex black gay wrestler or you're being told, well, you can replace ex-black gay wrestler i don't like that kind of stuff so while there are strides being made 150 percent there's still a lot I, there's still a lot more i congratulate go. the people that are honestly trying to do good however it is not the sunshine and rainbows that's being presented and i will never go into that narrative that's just, and that will cost me things in my career, but I just, I, I, I don't, I spot bullshit and I just, 
I call it. But there are great queer talent that should be supported. And that's where I stand on it. There are great queer talent globally that I'm meeting and talking to and hanging out with and doing stuff with. So where are some of your um, aspirations to perform? Oh, well, performing at Lucky Chang's, which was a historically gay venue, was awesome. Um, some of my goals is uh, I would love to wrestle on a Joy Janela Spring Break. To me, that just seems like a lot of fun. Um, so can we start a campaign to... for Billy Dixon for the clusterfuck next year? Yeah, I really would like to be in a clusterfuck, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see. Um, I um, I would love to wrestle um, all my sisters and brothers, uh, number one, anywhere. Um, I would love to wrestle uh, in Japan. Um, I would love to wrestle in Australia. I love to wrestle in London. Um, domestically, you know, the goal down the line is to make this, you know, a job where I'm contracted and I'm making, you know, the money that I believe I should be making. It's crazy. That to or to, to get a creative position Ooh. Um, would be really cool. Those are two of my big goals. Dusty Rhodes is my hero. My number, my number one, like my hero. Um, and I would love to be this generation's Dusty. Um, because I feel like that's missing in a way. Don't get me wrong. Cody and Dustin. Oh, geez. That was incredible. Oh, I, I haven't cried at a match in a while. That happened. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was it was really beautiful. It was art. That was That's when people call wrestling art, that's a great example. Um, but I would love to do that in my own way. And, um, you know, I do believe that I have an every man quality that people would love to see. So, um, yeah, my goals are just to grow, to get more exposure, more work, to, to train with, you know, higher places. And hopefully one day, you know, I wind up on your TV screen or your tablet and I'm getting paid like incredibly well. And there's, well, there's a lot of companies now. That's the plus side in wrestling. There's not just one place anymore. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of places, and um, I am working my butt off to get them to notice me. I I will say, um, because I'm feeling froggy now that I'm like awake <laughs> now. But, um, there was a very well known top three or four biggest company in the world that I was in talks with. And um, I would never work there. And you'll never see queer people work there because part of their gimmick is to softly ask you to get back in the closet. And I wasn't having it. So. I mean, I, I could theoretically. Pro- I could theoretically huh? probably out that company, but I am not. So <laughs> it's too early in the morning for that. Um, but yeah. So. So. The goal is to get signed, pretty much. Uh, so, do you have anybody you really like? Is there a dream opponent for you? Oh, John Cena. Did not expect that one. Um, I think he's actually like super great. Um, I think that me and him share an in-ring awkwardness that few wrestlers like are so clumsy to share um, because I'm not graceful. Um, And I also, in my mind, have this dream that I keep having, which makes me think it's going to happen one day, hopefully, where me and him wrestle for 30 minutes and it just revolves around a side headlock and then he eventually taps out. I've had that dream seven times. I would pay money for that match. Um, So I would love to wrestle John Cena. And I guess some other people... I guess to get like indie cred, um, I would love to wrestle. Uh, I would love to wrestle Marco Stunt. Marco is a Kevin tremendous Grace. dude. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I would, and I, I think, I think somebody that I think I probably would have like incredible chemistry with um, would probably be Sunny Kiss too. Um, and I think the last person that I look at and I'm like, I really would love to see how that would go, would be um, 
Uh, now, nah, my now the, the it'll come back to me. Hold on one second. Oh, would be um ah, uh, what's his name? I know his name. He's everywhere. Oh, Nick Gage. Oh, in the death match. That's not one I expected. What? <laughs> I would love to wrestle him in a death match. I think he's incredibly talented, and um, I think we'd have a lot of fun. We would have a lot of fun. Uh, you caught me off guard with that one. I did not expect to hear Nick Gage. I have a very weird, like, what I like is so, like, intersectional and, like, weird. And, like, there's so many cool things I want to do that hopefully I can do one day. Like, my dream is to have a gravy bowl ladder match. Because I just feel like, why not? I like your wrestling attitude matches. with wrestling. We're just having matches that we just go, why not? So, I, this is my favorite. Goes. I got to tell you, this is my, one of my favorite interviews I've ever done. I have been caught off guard more times than I've ever been in anything I've done on this website. So I'm super excited now. And especially awesome. if this happens, like I want to see a gravy boat ladder match now. I'm working on it. Me and Effie are actually working on it. So wait, I, is it going to be like a ladder in a, a, a pool or is like a gravy bowl going to be at the, the thing you have to retrieve from the ladder? Like now, like my mind is working overtime just thinking about it's a this. a big gravy bowl. <laughs> and then there will be something hanging up, maybe the Gravy Bowl Championship, and you have to climb the ladder to get it. If this show doesn't take place at Thanksgiving, I'm thoroughly sad. Oh, oh a turkey could hang from the ring. There we go. Now you're helping me out. <laughs> I'll give you a piece. I'm 100% okay with that. Uh, so let's let's talk about why I just how I found out how how uh, we came in contact. Uh, the Pride Pile Driver Project. This is unbelievable, and. I feel, how did this come about? This came about because I think all of the queer wrestlers will tell you that if there's anyone who's a queer history nerd, it's me. Um, also, growing up in New York and escaping high school to go to centers and hang out with like your elder queer statesmen really teaches you a lot about your history, especially hanging out with older queens. Like I'm talking 60s, 70s. They school you real quick. Um, and I learned about her history and then I did my own research and, you know, learning about M Marsha and the, this is the part where I actually, I actually could cry. The length of sacrifice that her, Sylvia Rivera and several other trans women did 50 years ago and a little bit before, I don't think people understand the level of sacrifice that they did when you are like doing survival sex work and the proceeds go to helping kids who are displaced have a place to stay. I can't tell you like how that touches me because I was homeless. Um, not for being displaced, for being queer, but just that kind of like call to action hero kind of stuff touched me. It's the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall uprising um, and, uh, also I got an email, uh, chain and I was denied to wrestle on one of the upcoming pride shows that are not associated with a matter of pride. Um, and I was very upset by that. And I was just like, but why is this straight person on this show or this person that I know is homophobic on this show? And I just washed my hands of it. And I said, you know what? That's not what pride is about. Pride is not about what I can gain from it. Pride is about the people that gave back, that helped their fellow brothers and sisters and everything in between to have a better tomorrow. So I sat down and I wrote ideas about what can I do to give back? And I said to myself, okay, there's a lot of queer wrestlers they're all nice people. They're all giving people. If we all gave merch and goodies and monetary donations and gift cards and things like that to two people, and maybe if we have things left over to a wrestling trainee that's queer, we can make a difference. And we can honor the legacy of our, our ancestors within our industry. So I contacted all the queer wrestlers. And little by little, I'm getting donations in on a daily basis. And the 
Pride Pile Driver Project is basically we're all putting our resources together and accepting monetary donations for shipping costs and for you know the, the goodies that we're purchasing for these people. And we have selected through a, through a rigorous search um, two people uh, that uh, are queer wrestling fans that have fallen on hard times. Uh, and one of our people is you know facing homelessness and just a financial like not great thing and another person is having issues with the family accepting the sexuality and being misplaced because of it and they're trying to get on their feet and we can't necessarily fix their problem you know right. but we can definitely put our resources together and at the very least give them a reason to smile you know so we are organizing these boxes and they're being sent out at the end of the month when we get all of our supplies and every wrestler and every organization and every person that has contributed to this project will be named and um, you know told to these people. These are the community that banded for this and we hope you appreciate it and we hope you love it. And that's what this project is all about. This is not about cool points, woke points, you know, look how great I am points. This is about helping people. This is about making a difference and 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 honoring the real spirit of pride. It's not about rainbow t shirts. It's not about it's not about um marketing. It's not about parades even. It's about fighting for what you believe in and fighting for people you believe in and helping people you believe in. And I really, really mean that. So I'm gonna probably cry now. Um, one of the things I've learned recently is that the wrestling fan community is a family and I didn't realize how big it was until recently with everything that happened in the past couple of weeks mm -hmm. and seeing your post, I, I, I got no words and <clears throat> seeing that this is coming together and yeah, we're helping out. I, I told you in the email, we're, we're going to help out too. And because this is, there are a lot of fans out there too, who I, I don't know how to put this, are still afraid to go to events. And I feel with representation like yourself and others, um, that stigma is going to go away. And because you are doing this amazing thing for the community. I, I don't even know. Like I have all the words and I can't talk. <laughs> like it's okay. Like this thanks. is a very emotional kind of thing, you know. Like I don't get me wrong. I've had I've had moments where I was floored by things and cried ugly tears. So I get it. Yeah, and 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 just seeing it, like I actually took the text or showed the, my wife the video, and we both sat and cried. Like we were like, this is the most amazing thing I've I've seen among the, the wrestling community is amazing and i didn't realize how great things are sometimes mm -hmm. until you see it from the outside perspective so yeah uh you can check out all about the pride pile driver project and we're gonna have anything you guys can anything we can do to help let us know that's on 100 uh, percent. we're so grateful that you guys are helping in you're stepping up and listen uh Every queer wrestler, we talk about these things. If we are on a show that you're at or nearby, if you have anything that goes on, we are a DM away. We are the first line of defense for our queer wrestling fans, and we really mean that. If we hear some shit goes down, we go to a promoter and we will rip their heads off. If a person, and this goes for anyone, if we hear about somebody being sexually assaulted or uh, harassed or menaced or threatened or maligned in any sort of way we don't tolerate that we don't tolerate that um my message for any queer wrestling fan listening to this that wants to go to an indie show while we can't promise that something isn't going to happen because we can't control other people's thoughts opinions whatever um actions uh or the, the climate of the promotion we can assure you that our goal 
is to change the face of what is it allowed and accepted at wrestling shows. And we are working very diligently to make it, to live up to the creed, creed that this is for everybody. Because right now, it would be a lie to say it's for everybody. We are working hard to make sure if you are trans, if you are non-binary, if you are disabled, if you are in a polygamous relationship, if you are young, if you are old, if you're in an interracial relationship, if you are um, in any way considered an outlier, you are welcome. You are welcome to sit and enjoy this art that we're giving to you. And if we are on your show, please DM us and we will make sure you are safe. And if you ever have a problem, we will take care of it and we will help you out because that's what we owe you for you supporting us financially and emotionally by seeing your faces in the crowd. That's what we owe you. I, I feel there's one other thing we have to touch on and you said it in your documentary. And um, if you are a LGBT child growing up and wanting to get into pro wrestling, what would be your advice? And I feel like you need to tell them your dream too, your ultimate goal. My ultimate goal is if I've made it to a big company and I've saved my money, I would like to offer uh, my services uh, and hire people for the world's first uh, LGBTQ wrestling um, wrestling school. Um, and it would be similar to like camp, all expenses paid, free, all you do is apply. You know, however spots we have, we have, and then we'll we'll take you in, we'll feed you, we'll clothe you, we'll bathe you, you know, yada, 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 all that good stuff. And you learn how to wrestle. And by the time you're done with our camp, which would be probably, realistically, would probably take an entire summer, would probably be the most fair way to do it. You will get the tools you need to go out and work. And that is my dream um, because I think it's really hard for queer people to, to train how to wrestle in an environment where, yes, sometimes the machismo energy chisels, chisels you up, makes you strong, but also I think that there's a lot of uh, navigating that is difficult um, for some people. And uh, there are certain things that a straight person can't tell you. You know, I, you know, and I want to create a school where you are prepared for situations that at a, at a regular wrestling school, you may not know about. So that's my goal, because I want people to be as comfortable as possible learning how to do their trade. But that's my biggest goal at the end of the day. I had to get that out of you. I, I felt like that had to be told. Uh, oh, um, yeah, that's my dream. That's my <clears throat> that's my ultimate dream. I would love to open up that kind of school. And I got inspired by the concept by watching Zoe 101. Weird, <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. That caught me off like, guard. <laughs> <laughs> like a like a boarding school but to learn how to wrestle and oh, it's queer great. inclusive that again we nick gage and so we went one in the same interview how how does this happen this is probably <laughs> one of the wildest interviews i've ever given so uh it is probably next here i've got to tell you it's probably one of the my favorite interviews i've ever done and you made it easy on at least me today so uh where can they find you online sir okay so um uh, I am on all my social media. That would be Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, and Instagram at the Billy Dixon. So that's T H E B I L L Y D I X O N. Um, if you are interested in in uh, working with the Pride Pal Driver Project, check my Twitter. It is my pinned tweet. Very much at the top, as soon as you click on my profile to get information, we are accepting um, monetary donations to help with costs and with uh, purchasing more goodies for our people. Um, and be on the lookout. In 2020, I will be running uh, an event called um, Billy Dixon's Banshee Block Party, where 100% of the proceeds will be uh, funded to help queer homelessness. We are currently working on locations and things like that and dates and all of that. So that will be in the work down the line. But in the meantime, the Pride Pro Java project is what we're doing right now because it's a much more attainable goal to do for Pride Month. And um, if you are a promoter that is listening to this, listening to this book Billy Dixon at gmail.com is your favorite email to contact one Billy Dixon to wrestle for your local promotion. 
And where are you going to be wrestling at soon? So uh, June 9th, I will be uh, in Providence, Rhode Island for a matter of right wrestling. I'm wrestling Kaden Pierre. June 15th, I'm uh, teaming with my tag team partner, uh, Jared Evans, and our tag team, the Uptown Downtown Connection, for Infinite Pro Wrestling in Columbus, Ohio, I believe. It's a great tag I'm team, team name. The rest of the month in July off, because <clears throat> mama needs a break. Uh, <laughs> And then in August, I'm right back at it with Infinite Pro Wrestling. And and, and in September, I am making a debut at a brand new company that I'm so excited to work for, that I love the people running it. And it is, I will give them a hope, a, a, a hint. It is in the Washington, D.C. area. And Ooh. the rest of the dates will come as follows. And I'm also going to be working with Pro Wrestling Magic in New Jersey. Right on. Uh, I Again, thank you for joining us. Like This has been one of my favorite interviews ever. 100 percent. thank you so much for having me this has been so much fun this hasn't even felt like an interview just like two friends chatting i really want to talk musicals now like i really like i think after this is over we like at some point yeah i've got to get you on one of the other shows just to talk musicals <laughs> oh let's get into it uh guys that's going to wrap up this edition of sns if you want to help out the pride pile driver project uh pick up one of our pride t-shirts and we're giving 50 percent of the trevor to the trevor project because that's also very important to me as well and we're doing 50 percent to the pride pile driver project and 100 percent of pros- pro- proceeds from these t-shirts are going to charity and i'm 100 percent fine with that uh pick those up uh my personal favorite shirt now is someone helped me design a transgender captain america t-shirt Oh, I love that. Yeah, one hundred percent in that one, and uh, I will be wearing that shirt a lot. Uh, so, uh, shop TBK, TBK Magazine dot com slash shop TBK, and I got to end the show like we end every episode here on SNS. If you're going to turn heel on your friends, make sure they're as gullible as Sting. We will see you next time, everybody. Oh, wow.